Welcome to Terrible Lizards, a podcast about dinosaurs with Dr. David Home and Izzy Lawrence. Hello and welcome to this bonus episode of Terrible Lizards. I'm Izzy Lawrence, obviously. Uh, Dave isn't here at the moment. He's he's wherever he is. We're in lockdown, but I still decided that you guys needed a special bonus episode, mainly because if you're listening to this, it means that you are a patron. And I just want to thank every single one of you for supporting the show this way. It really makes a huge difference. Honestly, we would not be working this hard to get new episodes to you without your support. So it really does make a difference. And if you're not a patron what how did they get hold of this well the plan is to release this episode sometime in 2021 so if you're not a patron and you're listening to this episode thank the patrons for um supporting us in this way but also you can support us i understand patreon isn't for everybody and not everybody has the income to support our content but if you want to support us in other ways, sharing episodes on social media, writing reviews, liking, it all allows the algorithm to spread the dinosaur love to everybody, not just um, you special people. But yes, the more we can grow our audience, the more keen I am to put out more episodes. So please do continue sharing and loving and enjoying. Now, this episode I particularly liked because um, it was an episode where the subject that Dave doesn't know anything about. We're calling it our chlorophylla episode. Chlorophyllia episode. It kind of works, it doesn't really. But yes, this is an episode all about botany. That wonderful thing that makes everybody exciting. It is really interesting, though. We have a uh, paleobotanist for you. You'll learn a lot, I'm sure. And I really hope that you enjoy it. Susanna Leiden. That's right. What, what is it that you do, Susanna? So um, I run the plant science degree at the University of Nottingham. So most of my day to day time is spent um, teaching students about living plants and what they do and doing that side of things. And then very occasionally, my, my at the moment, my research is at the level of I persuade undergraduate students that they should spend their time sieving um, Cretaceous rocks for me to find bits of plants for their research projects. Now you say you say finding bits of plants, but this is where this is where I'm going to go initially with my first question to you about yeah. plants in the past. Right, okay. The biggest problem I think I've got is plants do not have bones. This is true. Or yes. Shells, you you, you, you know about your plant biology. Yes, well done. I do know these things. I've never I mean corn on the cobs can be difficult, but no plants have bones. So what on earth how what is there to research? There are different, in the same way that you get different types of preservation for dinosaur material, uh, but you're right, um, if you've got bone, that's much more easy. And it's this idea of, 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 there's a term, I don't know whether you've talked about it already, preservation potential. No, I don't think we have. We, well, no. I don't, I'm sorry, not in that term, but we definitely talked about how, you know, muscle preserves rather less yeah. well than bone. And yeah, yeah. Teeth. Soft parts, squidgy parts don't preserve well. Hard parts, if you're talking about animals, so shell or bones or teeth they all preserve well um but it's a whole spectrum and different materials in different conditions will preserve in different ways um so yes plants don't have the sort of hard parts that you have in animals but plants have different materials so for example um pollen which is this really unimportant thing most people would think of in terms of paleontology but every pollen grain has a really really resistant material around it called sporopollenin which is a hard word to say yeah (laughs) But that material preserves really, really well. So if you have pollens in um, some mudstone or whatever, you can throw loads of acid at it and get those pollen grains out, look at them under the microscope, and you can say really cool things about what plants were growing where millions of years ago. So that's on the tiniest scale. Um, All the way up to, if you've got the right conditions, then a plant, you, you get lots of impression fossils. So it's where a plant has fallen onto a layer of mud, buried sand mud, sand mud, buried in the earth and the original plant material is not there but you've got that impression on a rock so that's another type there's really cool plant fossils where um you've had uh things places like um yellowstone park where you have um chemical rich water hot water um if that goes into and infiltrates all the cells of a plant you can then get cell petrified plants exactly so you've probably seen slices of fossil wood 
are really pretty. People make bookends and things with them, even coffee tables, so I gather. Um, <laughs> really nice coffee table. I haven't got one of those. Um, but you can get fossil woods with that level of preservation. You can get there's some really nice material from just after plants moved onto land where you've got that cell level preservation. It's a thing called the Rhiney Church. So it's from a village near Aberdeen. Um, and it's got this, so there's, they don't know where the fossils are anymore because, well, they do know where they are, but it's all been buried. The only way that you find them is where you see um, chunks of rock in walls. So it's dry oh, stone wow. walls. And they've got these beautifully preserved early land plants and you've got cell level preservation from 400 million years ago. And they're just amazing. And they're in somebody's like bathroom. Well, well for- <laughs> yeah, it's like somebody's bathroom. They're in, they're in walls. <laughs> they're garden walls. Um, yeah. Um, so there's that kind of preservation. And it's not just that particular one. There's lots of, so it's similar silicification, turning them into glass so that you have cell level preservation. So that's really cool. Um, And then the type of preservation I'm particularly interested in, we can divide plants into different groups. And a major distinction is that some plants have plumbing so they can move water and food around them. And some plants don't have plumbing. And that's things like mosses and liverworts. So, So they... Lichen. Lichen, are, yeah, lichen are. They're not. They're fungi. No, they're not fungi. No, they're, they're not even, thing. They're they're fungi. Damn it! I've complicated they're everything. Fungi and algae, or cyanobacteria, or actually quite yeah. a few other things, and sometimes yeah. even three whole species general combined mishmask. together. But they're yeah. green, so that's just confusing. <laughs> well, apart from the orange ones and the blue ones and the yellow. <laughs> yeah. Okay, fair enough. Like moss. Moss is definitely yeah. a plant. Yeah. Moss is a plant, liverwort, things like, there's a thing called Marcantia that looks like it's from a Dr. Seuss book. So it's like little umbrellas. Oh, yeah. um, and you'll see them if you buy plants from a garden centre that have been the soggy end of the, the garden centre. They'll have these little umbrella structures and they're liverwort. So those are non, non-vascular non plants is what okay. a botanist would call them. But you can say they're the plants without plumbing. The plants that do have plumbing, so they have xylem and phloem. So that might be something that you remember from school lessons where you're colouring in bits of plants. It's, it's ringing bells, <laughs> not, alarm not, bells not mainly, school, and my, it's bringing back sweats for tests. My, my first year <laughs> undergraduate, I had to do a botany course, and yeah. one of the major parts of that was xy- xylem and phloem maps for all the different plant groups, and it was torch. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and did they? Uh, yeah, there's a whole battle to be fought there on on persuading people that actually understanding how plants work can be quite. I have all this sort of weird, like the 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 cell wall stuff being different and yeah. active uptake and yeah, all these weird words that are somewhere in the back of my brain just going, oh, nitrogen fixing bacteria, yeah. things you know that <laughs> things that you never say, and yeah. when you do, you're just transported back to a room, and Mrs. Dalton is looking at you with a face <laughs> riddled with just despair but yeah, anyway so anyway. There, there are there are plants without root systems with no there's no transport going on it's just cell to cell stuff so they're really simple plants and they get their water they absorb their water over their surfaces the rest of them the ones with plumbing have to that, that is great because they've got plumbing so they can move water around they can be bigger and they can live further from water and those plants have an outer layer on their leaves um a waxy layer on the outside Um, that we call the plant cuticle. Okay. And in the same way that pollen has that really um, resistant layer around them, that waxy layer on leaves, um, given the right conditions, can preserve really, really nicely. And that waxy layer has the impression of the um, epidermal cells. So in humans, we have an epidermis and plants have the same thing, that outer layer. Um, it, It bears the impression of the epidermal cells below it. So if those bits of cuticle get preserved you can look at the cells of the plant that that cuticle was from so it's almost like it's its bones but on the outside it's almost like an exoskeleton but made out of wax yes it's a waxy waxy chemical sort of layer and you can see where things like so important part of this is that plants have um, stomata so air pores on the leaves again you can probably remember drawing a cross section of a leaf oh yeah there we go yeah. Uh, well, no, i think i think i'm trying to remember what we did so i remember there was one where we had to peel an onion and look at the because in between each onion layer you get that really thin, thin layer one. of just one cell yeah. that's the yeah, cell division that. layer yeah and there was something we said something with the back of the leaf to look at the stomata and i think either we just looked at it under a microscope or we like imprinted it with something I don't iodine know what we did yeah or Possibly you could do, iodine. so sometimes at school you can paint the outer layer of the the leaf with um, nail varnish 
Oh, yes, sometimes we do that, that. and yeah. then do an epidermal peel. Yeah, peel put that on a microscope ch- um, slide, and then you 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 can count the stomata. And it's... also, it just makes the leaf look really useful. Absolutely, yes, yeah. no, beautiful. Nice chemical peel. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, if you look at those bits of cuticle, you can see where the stomata are on that leaf. From so the stuff that I look at is about 120 million years ago, something like wow. that. So you can see the epidermal cells and how they're arranged. You can see where the stomata are and how they're arranged and how many there are and how dense they are. And that means you can a you can work out what plant it came from because you can compare it to modern cuticles. And B, you can use things like stomatal density, how many stomata it's got. You can relate that to how much carbon dioxide there is in the atmosphere where that plant grew. So you can use the cuticles as um, CO2 sensors through deep time. You can say, you can work out CO2. And what's the link? Is there more more stomata when the CO2 is higher or lower? When CO2 is higher, there are fewer stomata. Ah. So the plant has to, doesn't have to try as hard to get the CO2. So for, when we're for photosynthesis. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Um, so when the stomata are opening, you're, you, the plant's losing things like water. So it wants as few yeah. of them as possible. So if there's loads of CO2, there's no point having loads because it's just a way of losing resources and opening itself up to pathogens. So. But they are also respiring, aren't they? Yeah, they are. Yes. Just, yeah. Yeah. And through the R- same respiration stomata. will generate some, some CO2, so they don't care too much about that. Yeah, I suppose. <laughs> yeah. I know they can literally live in a bell jar. They're very clever like that. Do you, you get an idea of the climate? a little bit of the yep. climate by yep. what else can you tell just by say you find one fraction of leaf or one I mean, what are of... you finding you're not finding an entire plant preserved with the label still on saying i would really so. wish that we could find you know in the same way that occasionally you find um so for vertebrate stuff you might find an articulated skeleton with all the bits laid out in in an ideal world and occasionally we find plant material that has been preserved nicely with different organs connected but i think if anything paleobotany um is even more about fragmentary material and part of that is the fact that plants have different organs in different seasons so they're already plants fall apart even before they've died um (laughs) so we've got that um we've got all stages as well because even an oak tree if you get an oak tree at a week it's going to look very different to an oak tree at 500 years absolutely so you've got all these temporal things these these different time scales that 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 really mess it up for plants basically so when people first started doing paleobotany and finding bits of plants it was great in a time of discovery but it meant that every fragmentary organ so a leaf or a cone or um a root it all got given a different name so (laughs) so if you talk about so there's uh, the classic example is there's a tree from the coal measures a thing called lepidodendron um (laughs) but that's just the name of the stem of the tree and the roots called stigmaria and the cones are called lepidostrobus and there's a seed called lepidocarpon but it basically means that everything has multiple names yeah. I think we, we discuss this happens with dinosaurs as well. I think lots of species get turned, change yeah. over time as to who they belong to. It, it does, but I think it's a lot more rampant in plants because you, 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 you lack that connectivity. You know, it is very yeah. normal to preserve roots, but not the rest of the tree or seeds, but not the rest of the plant. Whereas if you found half a skeleton, there's a decent chance that you found some of the other bits on the end. And with yeah. trees, that's just not the case. And therefore it makes it mu- it's much worse for the botanist, basically. Yeah. And we do get really excited when we find something that has two organs together. So if you've got something that's got leaves and a cone, it's like, woo! Yeah. you know, but, but, but that, yeah, it's, it's, and certainly for the material I'm interested in, that's got that cuticle nicely preserved. That's not always the thing that's got the, the big gross morphology. So the stuff that mm-hmm. I like working on from the English wields and um, it's like tea leaves. It's like little fragments. Yeah. And do you ever make tea? <laughs> <laughs> It's a bit gritty. Well, I, I, yeah, I, I, I did hear stories a long time ago about a paleobotanist who did used to make tea from <laughs> fossil cuticle. <laughs> I'm not sure that was a good idea, really. It's got to be better. I, I read recently about some archaeologists who are working in Ireland and they found this um, trove and uh, this big pot of honey 
which, you know, and they started eating the honey because they, they obviously sent it away for testing. Once they'd opened it, it was going to spoil. So they had yeah. honey every yeah. day and this sort of thing. And eventually they got to the bottom of this and found a hand. <laughs> <laughs> Nice. Well, it's honey's a great preservative, so I can see why. Yeah, they're doing it is. It. it was magic cursed honey. Yeah. Yeah, Yummy. Strange, strange meaty flavour. Mm. Yeah. Mm. It's very nice honey. <laughs> anyway, what's I going to ask you? Yes, yeah, nuts and seeds and things like that. So you're finding cones, and yeah. what else are you finding? What's what's the sort of thing? There is a bit of a cut off. Um, basically, if you're looking at the stuff that's around when the dinosaurs were around, you have before the flowering plants and after the flowering plants. So it's kind of a key defining. So our planet today, if we go outside into my very dark garden now, um, surrounding us today, our planet is just completely um, dominated by the flowering plants. So anything that we eat, the plants that we grow in our gardens, generally speaking, um, everything that's not a, a Christmas tree or those mosses and things that I was telling you about and ferns, but everything else is a flowering plant. Even and grass, because they've got... Cause even grass. Makes yeah, grass, yeah, is, yeah. grass is a flowering plant. Um, so they are hugely... Yeah, our, our way that we view how plants work and how they, they dominate our planet is, is hugely skewed by the fact that angiosperms dominate our planet today. But if you go back anything more than about 110 million years... Uh, the flowering plants are they're probably there because the pollen records again going back to that tells us that we've got pollen that we think comes from flowering plants the angiosperms mm. so they're there but they're, they're this really inconsequential little bits of what's happening with plants at the time and before then the, everything is is dominated by um, the plants that we would call we'd call them the gymnosperms even though that's not a very scientific term no, things like tubers and stuff so, so gymnosperms is things like conifers, so Christmas okay. trees, and it's things like um, there's plants called cycads that you can often pick up at quite a, a nice pl- price at Ikea. Um, right. Um, a, 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 they look a bit like um, a pineapple with um, sharp fern-like leaves coming like off them. Like a yucca? Them. Yeah, a little bit like a yucca, but more more leaves coming off them. Okay. <laughs> they still grow these today. Home? So explain to me, because I understand, I understand the whole sort of like pollen meets stoma. No, stoma. No, is that right? No. Stamen is where the pollen comes from from is that the word well, the, 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 i want to say it's the antenna bit with the central thing and that's the, the anthers thing. And anthers and the sh- oh, oh god it was a long time ago <laughs> yeah, anyway, what's what I, mean? <laughs> I might be a biologist but it's not like i delve deep into plant anatomy during my life okay <laughs> basically i understand I some of how 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 the pollen gets inside the flower and then the yeah. flower later becomes a fruit or a seed or whatever you yeah. want and that's how it happens and then that fruit or seed's either eaten or it's deposited somewhere goes yeah. into the ground and that germinates and then you have a fl- plant yes what are conifers doing then? Conifers also have seeds. So the mm-hmm. distinction between the two is that things like conifers and cycads and, and there's another plant called ginkgo, which I'm a bit obsessed with, which is another of these plants. They have seeds and they have pollen. So they've still got um, mostly for, for most of them, it's um, air pollination, rather wind pollination rather than okay. the stuff that flowers specialise in with insects. Um, but it's still that pollen landing on um, uh, the cone structure, so the female cone. And then what you have is you have, so gymnosperm literally means naked seed. So what that means is the seed in the flowering plants is fully enclosed. Mm. So you've got an ovule, that's the female bit, and it's fully enclosed mm. in an ovary. So that's one of the things that make the flowering plants the flowering plants. Whereas in these other ones, like conifers, um, there's a little gap. And so it's called a naked seed because the pollen can get straight in. Wow. So it sounds like it's ripe for infection, that. It doesn't <laughs> sound very sanitary. Yeah. I <laughs> yeah, things like conifers have lots of, of ways of keeping, yeah, keeping bees away they're quite well, they're good pine fresh aren't they that's... they're pine fresh exactly exactly all those chemicals that we we think that smells really nice that's plants just finding good ways of keeping keeping animals away okay so they're using the wind to carry the pollen and it's much more random and less yeah. specialized than flowering ones okay yeah. but do ferns do that as well so ferns are even further removed so flowering plants are this really specialized thing if you go one step further back from the gymnosperms you've got ferns 
also plants called horsetails. So, yeah. They're, yes. they're very long, thin things which occasionally have little sprouts on them. That They're like little hollow tubes. Yeah. They often grow on railway sidings and places where things that... that, that shouldn't that, grow. That should, shouldn't grow and they exploit that. Yeah. And they're, they're jointed, kind of spiky looking things. So those plants um, haven't even evolved a seed. They just have spores. So if you look on the back of a fern leaf, if you've ever seen dots on the back of it, Maybe. each of those is a little a little container full of spores. So are they cloning themselves or are they No, so that's still it's it's but still reproduction. It's still reproduction. Um but ferns are also tend to be really good at just sp- spreading um vegetatively. So mm. yeah, if we're Tuba talking like. Yeah, if yeah, exactly. So rhizomes, tubers, those kinds of things. So a rhizome is a, is a little stemmy bit that goes either just above ground or, or under the ground and it's how those plants spread. So those things I was talking about, those horsetails, one of the problems with them and is why gardeners hate them is because if you've got horsetails in your garden um, and they've got those little rhizomes, you can't get rid of them because even all it takes is a little bit of rhizome left and they'll grow back. Brambles are a bit like that. Yeah, brambles have the same spreading thing. It's just they're, they're above ground. Yeah, kind of. Yeah. yeah, they just spread above ground. But yeah, no, the same idea. Plants quite often, they can just spread without doing the whole sexual reproduction thing. My, my favourite thing thing is um those spider plants that you get because you get one and then they just chain they link yeah. chain yeah. Yeah, so yeah, like, yeah, i can yeah, see yeah. my great great stuff. great great granddaughter over there <laughs> all still linked up i mean that's one of the great things about plants is that they are very very good at just you know it's so um things like we get really excited about stem cells in animals and how difficult it is to work with them and doing all that stuff and it's like plants just say yeah i can i can just make another plant from this little bit and they just reproduce and they're also quite hard to get the species of aren't they because they all sort of bonk each other <laughs> to put it Nice. Yeah, um, hybrids are much more common, I think, is the other way of putting that. Yeah. Is, isn't, it, isn't it something like 50% of angiosperm species are supposedly linked to It's something to obscene like that. Yeah, it's, it's yeah. an enormous amount. Yeah. You think how many, you know, we know of maybe a handful of mammal species which have come about because two species have hybridised to produce a new third one. And some of those are a bit questionable. This is so common for yeah. plants. And and the other thing is they're not even necessarily close relatives. So yeah. there's a thing in North America called the red wolf, which you can argue whether or not it's truly a species, but it's basically a hybrid of grey wolves and coyotes, which are really, really close relatives of each other, which is why they can do it. And even horses and donkeys are really close to each other, but they produce mules which are sterile. Plants are just like... You've got the equivalent of, you know, oh, here's an aardvark and here's a kangaroo. Yeah, fine. We'll hybridize that. <laughs> and, you know, and, and here's a rat and here's a tiger. Yeah, they can crossbreed. It's fine. Yeah. The but- other thing that plants do on that front, which we think is deeply weird, is the fact that um, it's the idea of polyploidy, which is a lovely word. So polyploidy means that lots and lots of plants, and again, angiosperms are really good at this, is having multiple copies of your genome. So we are diploid. We have two copies of our genome. Um, Lots of plants have, let's say, bumped that up over the years. So the wheat that we all rely on in our diets, um, wheat is a hexaploid. So it has six copies um, there's loads and it's not just angiosperms actually there's ferns as well that are polyploid up to sort of like 16 32 um 64 yeah 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 um, oh wow so it's it's yeah i don't know how far it goes up actually 128 256 512 uh, prob- <laughs> probably not that, i mean the beer but that there are definitely some which are over 10 which when you think about it is really quite a lot and that's 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 yeah. often associated with with changing the size of the plant fundamentally yeah. if you have a much bigger nucleus with much more DNA in it, you get a bigger cell. And if the cell's bigger and it still has the same number of cells as the original, it will be much bigger. So it's also a weird way that you can get like much bigger plants than normal in the polyploids. And again, if you look at the fossil record, so those bits of cuticle I was talking about, you can see the stomata. You get much bigger stomata on the plants that have uh, had this doubling of their genomes. So we've got a fossil way of measuring um, genome doubling, which is quite cool. Now, this is mainly because I got stuck on the thought of um, polyploid and marrying a Mr. Ploid and having a baby and calling it Polly. <laughs> oh, I like that. that. I got stuck there. <laughs> and I, I think, I don't know if I'm understanding this 100%. Yeah. 
So when you say that we've got one, we've got two copies because we've got the helix of the DNA. Is that what you're talking about? No, so no, that's got, the, no, 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 no. Okay, this is this is this is why it's important that Izzy understands these things because otherwise she gets a wrong idea in her head. So when you say, what do you mean when you say this information is doubled and tripled, and how, how does that look? What what is that? So if you looked at um, any one of our cro- the chromosomes that we have of our okay. DNA, so okay. you have two chromosomes you have two uh, two copies of each of those chromosomes except for the sex chromosomes yeah. where you have you have two x's well i do yes dave only has a half <laughs> it's, it's stubby it's not right but yeah but this, this, but this is one from this is one from each parent this is what sexual reproduction is and this is this is the this is the formation of gametes eggs and sperm or their equivalents is you're basically taking your two copies and then mixing them around and then taking one set, so one of chromosome number one, one of chromosome number two, one of chromosome number three, and dumping them in a cell. And then when and that, that cell meets osis. during sex or after sex, then you've got two full copies again. So most yeah. there are some weird things like some ants and various flies are haploid and they have actually only one set of copies, but the vast majority of animals will have two. But what these plants are doing is doubling that two to four or six or eight or so higher numbers. So when they've got, because like I, the big the big thing with this is like if you've got blue or brown eyes and like they say one's one's got a recessive allele and one's got a dominant allele and the dominant yeah. allele is the one that takes over. So you might have both both sets. You might have a little B for your blue eyes and a big B for your brown eyes, and that means you have brown eyes. There's yeah. only when you get with somebody who has a little B that you get the blue eyes. When you've got four, <laughs> what wins? How can you what? Well, is I mean, there a battle? Is it like, does it get to like Lord of the Rings where all of the alleles just decide in a massive <laughs> big fight? What? Well, well the, the first problem is most things aren't decided like that. I mean, that's how we often teach it. Because, and, and for some traits, they are genuinely that, that single point is the difference to be what makes it. But many, many, many features of most organisms are a whole mixture of alleles and a whole <sighs> mixture of genes anyway. Yeah. So, And actually, the really useful thing from, a, sort of a, again, an even evolutionary point of view is if you've got multiple copies of your genome and the environment changes because you've got multiple copies of something that originally does one job you can multitask and those genes can slowly evolve and start doing lots of different things in the plants and that's how you end up plants being really kind of long-term survivors one of the reasons we think is the fact that with this polyploidy you can actually become a multitasker and they can all evolve off in these different genes for different jobs within the plant cell can evolve slightly differently and diverge and you end up with a, a more resilient response to your environment that's, but considering we kind of learned about genes through the you know through peas i think it was yep. Yep. wasn't it yeah yep. This is the, we. He, he picked the wrong thing to experiment on, really. <laughs> well, no, he picked, no, he picked the wrong thing because yeah. it was really straightforward. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, and probably the story that we again, the story we get told, is a bit more straightforward than the reality. Again, um, but yeah, no, I mean, nice example. And well, there's lots of things that we learned about in lots of microscopy, microscopy. <laughs> Um, lots of that work um, was done first in plants. Um, there's lots of reasons why plants they are don't move. useful. Yes, yeah, they don't the, the, you have to fill in fewer ethics forms whenever you want to do. Yeah, your when you when you lop a bit off them, they, <laughs> they get they get less upset. Yeah. So, what do you know about? The change that happened, because you, you mentioned this before, the change that happened, why did plants suddenly start to specialise and have flowers and that sort of thing? What are the advantage of flowers over, let's just chuck our gunk out and see where it lands? <laughs> why would you want to specialise in this way? And what allowed, what brought about this change, do you reckon? It's, that's a really big question. And uh, it, it's, people have been asking it. So Darwin... Was it the bee unions? <laughs> yeah, did <have> they <laughs> pressurise... <laughs> Darwin called it an abominable mystery, this mm. whole switch over from a uh, gymnosperm-dominated don- um, world to this angiosperm-dominated world. Um, and having more um, reliable fertilisation, having that that um, specialising... I mean, why just spread your stuff out if you've got a willing insect who you know will come to your plant because you've evolved to attract that plant to... That, that insect to your plant um, are much more reliable and really complicated in some cases into sort of... Um, 
co-evolution of daft structures of both plant and animal in order to do that pollination. It's like targeted marketing on Facebook. You need totally. the technology there yeah. in order to be able to do it. Yeah. So you need Facebook to exist and bees are Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> but the thing is, some of these things were already there in before the flowering plants emerged. You already had some good examples of really targeted, again, the Facebook kind of thing, of really targeted insects and gymnosperms. So we've got some really nice examples of, so if you're thinking about which came first, was it insects or, or flowers driving this? We've got examples from before we've ever seen a flower. You've got really sort of targeted pollen pollination between beetles and some there's a group of plants called the benetites which no one has ever heard of they sound like some religious sect basically <laughs> um, um, but these benetites which if you've ever seen an illustration from a, a children's dinosaur book and again there's, there's a there's a thing that looks a bit like a, a, a disheveled pineapple mm. with with leaves coming off it so that's that's usually a benetite um so those plants, we've got really good fossil evidence for them being beetle pollinated um, in some cases. Um, other cases, there's a really, there's a really amazing fossil of um, before there were butterflies. So butterflies hadn't evolved as far as we know, but there are things called there's um, an animal called a katydid. Which is an insect, did. yeah, They're very grasshoppery. Uh, sorry, no, that's not the one. A lacewing, uh, lace wrong wing. word. Lacewing, lace yeah. Um, lace wings. Get, you get them in the UK gardens. There was a lacewing from an extinct group which had a ridiculous name, Calamagratid. Calamagratid. Calamagratid lacewings that look the fossils. They look like butterflies. They look like a modern butterfly group. They've got a sort of an eye spot on them on the fossils. They're amazing. Um, and they're found associated with a particular species of benetites, which are plants that have not flowers, but flower-like organs. So way back in the middle of the Jurassic, you already have a butterfly-like animal, which we think is um, acting as a pollinator for a plant that isn't quite a flowering plant. So what does not a flower look like? <laughs> <laughs> it looks like sort of a bit like a flower, but it's not that fully enclosed. You know, that, that bit about having a fully enclosed ovary. They don't mm. have that. So they don't count okay. as full blown flowering plants. And it's, that's what's count, not the sort of the petals, the colour, the smell. Yeah. Whether so they so, win so, awards. so th they're round organs and, and but, but yeah, no petals that no we petals. know of. So, so I've got a related question. Archaeofructus, which yeah. is a plant that is supposedly the earliest flower, which is what its name basically means. I, I've even seen the original Archaeofructus specimen oh, in China. Oh, you lucky thing. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's, it's yet another thing from the fossil beds of China that produce so many feathered dinosaurs because it's yes. exceptional preservation. It preserves lots of soft tissues, including this super early flower. Yeah. But there's going back to the 90s through to the probably still only about 10 years ago we had a big problem whereby we didn't realize that there were basically two different sets of fossil beds preserving the same kind of stuff on top of each other so everyone was lumping these together and it's only relatively recently that we discovered that one is from the early cretaceous and one is from the latest part of the middle jurassic so they're, they're something like 30 or 40 million years apart and loads of the stuff that we dug up early on no one actually really checked or wrote down quite where they got it and Archaeocryptus, my understanding, is one of these. And so it's a really big deal as to whether or not there were true flowering plants in the Cretaceous yeah. or were they actually in the Middle Jurassic. And because yeah. I don't know plants at all, that's a very long-winded question because I know you know all of this, but the <laughs> listeners don't. Is Archaeofructus <laughs> actually Jurassic or Cretaceous? Or do we not know? So my understanding and, and everyone who I have ever spoken to about thinks it's Cretaceous. Yeah, that's what I Everyone heard. thinks it's early Cretaceous. I don't think, I mean, it, obviously it hit the headlines when it got announced as a Jurassic angiosperm. Was that the late 90s, probably? Yeah, I think it's a bit later. I think it's something like 2005-ish. Yeah. Because I remember it yeah, coming out and be. I think I was in Germany at the time. Actually, I, I, I will yeah. Google in the background. <laughs> there we go. Um, but you yeah, no, in... I don't think there's Sorry. anyone who thinks it's Jurassic. Right, okay. Is my understanding. Also, a lot of that Jeho material, um, that stuff I was saying about the cuticle being really useful and telling us what sort of plant it is as well as things to do with its environment 
um, the cuticle's not there in that Jehol material, or right. at least I've not seen any evidence for it because if that was there we'd be able to say a whole lot more about those plants my understanding is most of it is just that impression yeah material okay. so it's, it's like a brass rubbing of a flower yeah exactly so so interpretation is much much harder if you don't have that extra information that's telling you about the cell arrangements and all that detail if all you've got is the the shape it's an outline rather than a yeah, yeah. so it's open to lots of different um, interpretations your eye might sort of tell you things are there i guess it's almost like the difference between having a footprint and having a foot yeah absolutely you'll you'll get some information but it's gonna be it's gonna be tough yeah okay uh, Wikipedia says 2002. Oh, there we go. So, yeah, right, yeah. right, bet- right between the two of us of, of, yeah. of the dates. <laughs> and for listeners interested, Dave was in Bristol. So maybe... <laughs> 2002? No, no, two? No, did three to four years Yeah, no, no, was, yeah, I was still there. Because that's when Izzy was there. <laughs> that's why she Yeah, that's when, I, that's when I remember him, you that's see. That's when we it's met. 2003 ah. we met, I think, or four. Three or four, something like that. Yeah. So what was I going to say? I was going to ask you about landscapes forests density do we know anything about the you know from the plants about what sort of landscapes we're looking at i I moaned about having these tea leaf bits of of plant material that i worked on but actually because you've got lots and lots of tea leaf bits you can actually say a bit more stuff about what the overall picture might be than if you're looking at individual nice, pretty hand specimens that are, you know, far and few between. Whereas if you've got a bag of stuff that's from a storm bed that was was all collect all, all got washed down off the uplands at once into a flooded environment, got buried, and then I've dug it out with a spoon on the beach on the Isle of Wight and stuck it in a bag. Got an entire river basin's <laughs> worth of botany to get through in a small little bag yeah but you've got a, a bit more of a representative sample maybe and and for the people who work on pollen so the palynology people even more so they have really representative kind of snapshots of the plant life around them so we can say a fair bit actually about what we think the vegetation would have looked like and we can work out that yeah we've got big conifer forests because these samples are all dominated by by conifer material so big conifer forests these other gymnosperms things like cycads, things like ginkgos, um, benetites I've already mentioned, all these things that are, yeah, big leafy shrubby things also making up a bit of that um, ecosystem. You've still got things like ferns and mosses and horsetails and all of those things forming this understory. Um, So we can say quite a lot. And the other thing worth thinking about is if you've got these huge animals and you've got this this ecosystem that's reliant on those plants you must have had huge amounts of plant material um just to sustain that kind of of food web well i was going to ask without much fruit on them and you know grass now but of course grass is you know is is a modern innovation (laughs) exactly so what, what i mean how edible are these things Um, Because hardly anything eats ferns now. Yeah. But if you actually... So um, one of my colleagues, Barry Lomax, who works with me at Nottingham, and he worked with someone called Fiona Gill um, at Sheffield, I think. Um, They did an experiment to try and answer that question. So they grew lots of these plants that I've been talking about in the levels of CO2 that you have in the Mesozoic. So much, much higher levels of CO2. And they grew things like ginkgos and ferns and horsetails in these growth cabinets in this CO2 rich atmosphere. Um, and then what they did was they took these plants and they stuck them into fermentation tanks to simulate being in a dinosaur's stomach. <laughs> And then they did, they worked out the nutritional value. So in the same way that, that food scientists do that kind of calculation for different food materials, um, particularly for things like working out animal livestock, kind of the best food for them. Um, they did those calculations with this fermented material and worked out which of the foods would be the most nutritious. And actually, it was things like the horsetails. So these plants that we think are just these weedy, annoying kind of weeds that, that everyone gets annoyed with. If you grow them at Mesozoic CO2 levels, and that's a huge sweeping statement because obviously the graph goes up and down throughout the Mesozoic, but elevated CO2, they were the things that were the most nutritious. That's weird. It is. 
you, I'm just thinking now there's a massive mark. You know how paleo diets are big in? Imagine yeah. doing Cretaceous diets. That was <laughs> having whole fields that are kept yeah. at a certain CO2 level for you to well, make into protein powders. That whole paleo plant thing is a complete nightmare if you're Googling stuff because people think oh, paleo yeah, yeah. plants and they just think that I'm, I'm talking about, you know, eating no carbs or something. Yeah, I've had that. But, yeah. but, but, that's a, but that whole thing about the, the um, you know, the productivity and the, 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 the amount that comes out. We, we've talked about this more than once before on the podcast in terms of issues of dinosaur size because a really common question is just how do you get an animal like a sauropod, which is five times bigger than an elephant? How on earth can it possibly feed itself? And one of the answers is if it's eating stuff which is actually much more nutritious – then you don't have to eat that much in terms of volume. So it's not this it has to be eating 24 hours a day and consume tons and tons and tons of material. The rules are different. Yeah. yeah. And, and, you know, and then you get into issues of efficiency as well, which probably make it even better. And what was interesting was that the horse tails were about twice as nutritious as conifers. Yeah, it's, an, it's enormous. Values. So where we've got all those models of sauropods stripping needles off pine tree equivalents and, and eating those things. But if that's only half as nutritious as just gobbling up meadows of horse tails. Yeah, but Diplodocus teeth were adapted to it. <laughs> <laughs> we've done. We, we've talked about uh, them eating pine and le- um, branches a bit like I eat a solero. Oh, nice! You just put it all in your mouth. Mm-hmm. Yeah, 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 yeah. Exactly. Yeah. That's that's what you need to do. Cool. Oh, I mean, so it just tells us really tons about the climate because obviously we know what life would be like under those temperatures. And but yeah, I'm just trying to think of a clever question, Dave. Can you think of a clever question? Well, I'd, I'd go back to the pollen, which I think we've mentioned in previous episodes, but not really talked about. And, and Susie's obviously mentioned it already. Um, so pollen is often very identifiable, not just down to groups, but even down to genera and even species in some cases for these fossils, you know, the very long time ago. And because pollen preserves so well, because it's so robust, that's actually a brilliant record for plants. Um, and so in, you know, in some cases, you know, because plants normally preserve very rarely, you look at something like Dinosaur Provincial Park in Alberta, where I've been to lots, it's one of the best places in the world to find fossils. You find chunks of wood all the time, little bits, and occasionally you get leaf beds. So you do get fossil leaves and fossil branches, but basically... There's hardly anything there. I mean, right. that was the thing. When I went, I was so disappointed because because I'm used, again, English Wealdon, and you have these lovely plant debris beds and you have these little bits of tea leaf that I know will tell me stuff. And when I visited Dinosaur Provincial Park and walking around, and yes, they had hadrosaur thigh bones sticking out of the ground. Lovely. Who but cares? there was Yeah, where's the plant material? <laughs> right, but that's the you know, there, there are very rare leaf beds and I've, I've been out there with students who found really nice leaves. But yeah, 99.9 plus percent of what you find if you're going around for a couple of weeks just on a normal dig is bone and teeth and shell. But the pollen is there in staggering quantities, which of course you just don't see. The Tyrrell Museum's paleontologist. Um, yeah, I mean, you can track, you know, not quite annual, but, you know, if you take a sediment core, so you take a basically a big column and then cut it up into lots of little fine layers, you can see almost the seasons changing by what pollen is coming in and going. And, oh, there was a few years here where they clearly had a few more ferns and then next year they had less ferns and a few more conifers. And you can just track that for thousands of years. And no one thinks about that when they think about the dinosaurs or even the plant fossils because they go, well, there's some nice leaves, but... Yeah, it's just not very photogenic, is it? That's the problem. Yeah, and it's tiny. You can't put it on display. <laughs> it's... Yeah, um, but also you've got that issue that a lot of the key dinosaur sites, the plants are rubbish because yeah. the conditions it's, that are great for preserving other. bones aren't the same conditions that are good for, for, for plant preservation. So, yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I guess people who work on plants, are, yeah, we have a tougher job with the PR anyway. <laughs> because <laughs> plants are boring apparently um i yeah. don't know one of the best subreddits is our house plants it's true that's great it's yeah. beautiful i get very <laughs> envious <laughs> So so that's part of the problem is that, that if everything got preserved nicely in the same place, we'd have a much richer sort of understanding, I think, of the interactions between the animals and the plants. What we need is for there to be a resin canyon 
there? <laughs> well, that actually is a very good question. Amber. Yes. Because obviously this features heavily in fiction, works of fiction, the Indeed. idea of insects <laughs> being trapped in amber. Yeah. How well is amber actually preserved? Do we have lots of cases? I know nothing about the preservation of amber. So what is... So there are different plants that um, have produced amber through geological time. I mean, most of it is presumed to be from conifers. There's So for more recent ambers, so the Dominican amber, I think, is that an angiosperm that, that produces that? I can't remember. There's a different plant for the really recent ambers, but the further you go back into the past, the more we think it must be conifers. There's some bits of resinous material that are from other um, gymnosperms, things like ginkgos as well. There are different ambers produced by different plants. Okay, and but they do preserve, and that, are, are there any? Do you know how old the oldest bit of amber is? Again, that's a really good question. I know that there's amber in the Cretaceous, and I've found little amber fragments in the earliest Cretaceous rocks that I've looked at. Um, I don't know of much amber that's very much older than that. Okay. Um, one of the most famous, the, the, the really controversial amber that people work on at the moment from Myanmar. I don't know whether you've covered at all about... I don't think so. Well, if we have, I wasn't listening. So <laughs> <laughs> There's really spectacular... Um, um, finds of all sorts that have been recently, the last 10 years or so, particularly, um, this amber has had, it, it's where they found um, uh, dinosaur feathers in it. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and they found an uh, ammonite. So, you know, these these mollusks with the curved, the, 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 the snail-like shells that, that swam around in the sea, they found an, 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 an ammonite preserved in amber. So the, the situation where that must have happened must have been really quite, quite elaborate. Um, yeah. But this amber is amazing has amazing things preserved in it and uh, it comes from a war-torn bit of the planet and so the ethical issues about the collection of it and the sale of it (laughs) are all a bit yeah yeah, dodgy dodgy if we could just end all wars so we can have a look at your amber yeah a few of your rocks that'd be lovely yeah it's it's been a big issue recently with several things that have been published because and, and and it's there's multiple ethical issues i mean obviously by far and away is the treatment of the locals and it's you know funding a nasty regime etc cetera, etc cetera. but then equally the stuff that is coming out is almost certainly illegally exported at some level and therefore you're also you know causing issues in the this you know there's been lots of science colonialism in the past there's lots of problems with various historical fossils and i'm not getting into a defense or argument about things that are in the natural history museum and munich and and other places but right right now should we really be exporting and then exploiting what is myanmar's fossil cultural heritage and we probably shouldn't anyway on top of the fact (laughs) that there's the small matter of genocide um so it's you know it's it's ethically problematic in multiple different ways and i'm not again not suggesting that one of them isn't by far away the biggest but we would we would even if there was nothing going on just the you know politically just the fact that this material is just popping up on the market and being sold and auctioned is problematic in itself i was just going to say a lot of the the journals where we publish our papers are already reacting to this and a lot of them will not publish material that's that's Myanmar and paleontology journals have but then you've I don't know about in in your side but on mine you know on the on the animal side there's been an issue with it in that of course this is a problem which is well understood among paleontologists but yeah. not necessarily among non-paleontologists no. and if you've got a particularly exciting insect for example yeah. or you feather. Get, yeah but right but you can get it into a you know basically a better more high profile journal which deals with general biology and there the editors yeah. and the referees don't understand that yeah. issue um and won't not they won't do due diligence they would have no expectation to check on it and they'll treat yeah. it like any yeah, other fossil that's true. and yeah. so you've, you've actually got this weird separation where the paleontology journals are trying to ban it but a lot of the higher profile journals aren't yeah. because they don't realise it's a problem. And so the stuff is still coming out. Yeah. There are still some paleontology journals who seem to be have their entire um, volume is is Myanmar amber material. So, yeah. Yeah. And, well, and, and a similar problem that we have with some of the, you know, Brazil, I think, is a good example. So yeah. Brazil, fundamentally, it's illegal to export their fossils. Yeah. Um, but that came in, I think, it, something like the 1950s or even 1930s was officially when that law was put in place. 
And, of course, stuff still gets exported all the time. And because they're fossils, people just go, oh, yeah, my my great grandfather was happened to go to Brazil in the 1920s and yeah. he brought this back. And it's just been sitting in my family for 100 yeah. years and now I'm selling it. And, of course, you really can't prove that they haven't. Once that stuff is out of the country, it is almost impossible to prove. See, what we're doing is we're inviting a load of Brazilians to come to Aberdeen and start dismantling the walls. This is to try and get the fossils out. Actually, if you go to Paddington in the station on the concourse, you can see loads of shells and the granite and everything else. That's and... true of loads of places. Yeah. There was, I think it was, was it a, a church or a cathedral? I want to say in Italy, where it turned out there was a dinosaur bone, quite surprisingly, in cross section, oh, wow. like in a big panel. Cool. Um, and the shells are normal because, of course, it's it's usually marble and it's yeah. a bit, and occasionally fish and marine reptiles, but it was genuinely shown to be dinosaur. So this is very rare because it's a dinosaur that sank in the sea and got preserved and then turned up in the wall of this church. Very cool. It's, it's almost like God ordained it. <laughs> There's whole little blogs out there devoted to fossils in walls and floors and ceilings and yeah, yeah, shops yeah. and supermarkets. Urban geology. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That sounds like it's going to be so cool and then not. Um, <laughs> <laughs> never mind. It's a, mi- it's a mixture of rap and rock music because geology makes the bedrock or something. Anyway, I'm going <laughs> to stop talking. Um, what, what, should, what do people forget? To, I mean, what, literally, I'm going to ask you, what should we be asking you about? What's the latest thing? What's happening? What's I get quite excited about the idea that we have these plant sensors through time. The fact that we can use things like the cuticle to tell us these things all the way through deep time about how plants are responding to the environment. And so that can tell us really cool things about the planet on a whole scale that is it's you're just using the plants as a way of telling you the wider picture. Um, there's also these little snapshots of time. So, so things like where, because plants are made up of these little units that have this plant cell wall around them, so that we do get that that cellular preservation that I think that sometimes astounds people. So when you, like I talked about those fossils from the Rhiney Church, where you've got cellular preservation from 400 million years ago, and you can see these lovely, if you chop the rock and turn it into thin sections, so you grind it down so you can look through it with a microscope and you can chop it. At the, you do enough slices and you will end up with a, a nice cross section through the stem of these tiny little plants. Um, and you can see inside them, those plants have already. So another thing that people don't think about much is the relationships between plants and fungi. So lots of plants have these things called mycorrhizae, which are these fungi that, that are associated with plant root systems. And Nitrogen fixing, is that yeah, right? That, that kind of stuff. But these, these are actually just sort of increasing the, 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 the surface area that the plant can forage with its roots, basically. Okay. And the, the, they've got this, it seems like this hugely, so it's really important for um, uh, food production for us is the amount of, of plants that we can grow, that biomass that we can make to feed our population is totally reliant on these mycorrhizae. In most food plants, the mycorrhizae working with the root systems to help the plant get its nutrients. They did a thing of this on Autumn Watch. They, they basically ah, had right. one of those, um, oh, what's they called? You know, the magic toadstool mushrooms, the fly, yeah. ag- fly, fly agaric. Yeah. That- that one, yeah. yeah. And they basically put a load of fairy lights showing the extents of its system, the yeah. mycorrhizae system. Yeah. And then they showed the plant root system all in fairy lights and how they cool. all interlinked. Yeah. And then they said, so this tree here, if it didn't have this mushroom growing here, yeah. its root system would stop here. But yeah. now we know its root system can go all the way out because it's yeah. using... Um, and there's this sort of co uh, cobiotic relationship, co yeah, yeah, something yeah. relationship. It's a symbiotic relationship, symbiotic, absolutely. And we know word. that that symbiotic relationship was there right back. So not long after plants moved onto land 400 million years ago, we can see that mycorrhizae plant relationship in these beautifully preserved cell level. Um, samples from 400 million years ago. Which so is the really plants cool. get extra sort of, I suppose they get extra reach for water and things. What do the mushrooms get? They or get do they well, they get a both. nice place to live and they get materials from the plant as well. They get carbon. Okay, um, okay so, fair enough. So you've got, yeah, it's, it, it's, it's, it's proper symbiosis. 
And over geological time, it looks like different plants have associated with different fungi. Um, but as a strategy, it's, it's like that. Yeah, we, we sort of think of things as organisms as distinct things. But actually, there's no. symbiotic relationships all over the shop on all sorts well, of yeah. different scales. Talk to my gut bacteria. Yeah, exactly. We know. I going to say, yeah. it's, you know, it's, it's constant like that. And yeah, it's, it's, it's so many things, you know, because we tend to think of all this associated stuff as being negative. You know, it's ticks and fleas and yeah. diseases and infections and viruses. But yeah, a huge amount of it is positive or at least neutral. Yeah. Um, you know, we, we, you know, most of us have mites in our eyelashes that yeah. don't really do anything. They just eat a bit of wax, which otherwise would go to waste. And it's not like we suffer from their presence. So they're doing all right at the deal. We don't really get anything, but we don't notice. But surprisingly, when you tell people that, they don't like it very much. <laughs> I, show, I show my undergrads photos of them and they're horrifying. <laughs> Is the question is, do they eat mascara, and how bad is mascara? Is there a mini mite that's you know out there going, you know, interviewing these other mites who've been coated in mascara <laughs> and asking what their issue is and whether they're going to move and. The other bites need to send money it's to help. It's being tar and feathered, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Or I'm is just, the one you know. that's evolving to actually specialise in mascara-rich exactly. eyelashes? Because, I mean, one of the great extinctions happening is in pubic lice as well, isn't it? That's mm. one of the main... Oh, right. Yeah. But that, that's, uh, you know, I, I prefer mites to my eyelashes to the other. Anyway... <laughs> Well, excellent. Well, that ended up disgusting. Well done, Susie. <laughs> yeah, we, we brought you on to talk about plants. By the way, pubic lice. <laughs> it's so good. Okay. Well, I'm not sure it is good. <laughs> cool. So, um, yeah, is there, if, what, what would you recommend? Somebody who's brand new to the subject, what would you recommend they go and have a read of or look at? Oh, Beerling. David Beerling has written a couple of really nice popular science kind of books. One of them is called The Emerald Planets. Oh, okay. yeah, that rings a bell. That yeah, and up. there was another one that he wrote more recently that I haven't read yet because I got given it last Christmas and I haven't got round to it. Well, it's only November. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know what got in the way. Um, so so they're really nice. Um, there's So the, one of the things is, is, is the same as, as kind of the, the whole not having good PR. We don't have as many really sort of approachable books about this side of things, partly because I think publishers don't think... Oh, you know, mesozoic plants. Do yeah, you know what's more exciting big than the normal plants? <laughs> Old plants. Old plants. <laughs> so Paul Kenrick, who is a paleobotanist at the Natural History Museum in London, he's written a couple of books that are quite good. Um, if it's what plants do that is interesting, there is a really good podcast called, um, well, blogger and podcast and does a few vlogs as well called In Defence of Plants. Oh, yes, I know that. And they do really nice stuff about a lot of the plant groups that I've mentioned. So they don't just do the, the, the flowering plants, which every person thinks is interesting. I, I'm not interested in them. They do a lot of stuff about the conifers and the cycads and, and all of those cool things as well. So that would be a good tip. And anything yeah. else you think we should ask you? Can selfish. you think of anything, Dave? No, I think I think we've I think, we've, we've covered the majority because because we've talked in the past about what dinosaurs are eating and how they're eating it, but that yeah. I I know I have a poor understanding of those landscapes and the timing of those events and what's yeah. shifting and when. And we've covered problem, all that quite well. Yeah. Part of the problem with all that stuff is a lot of it is just so speculative that I sort of feel a, like a bit of a fraud, sort of saying we've definitely got these relationships that we can talk about. We've got some evidence from teethware. We've got a little bit from coprolites and things but at, at some levels you know big, big herbivores can't afford to be too choosy that, so that you know at some level everything's being eaten yeah by and, big sauropods or big hadrosaurs and ceratopsids yeah. because it just would have yeah been. and big big animals in big herds as well so things like iguanodonts moving through a landscape i mean that must just be stripping everything yeah if you well, i mean we've got evidence of you know centrosaurus which is you know best part of a tub but it was a big size, you know, good size uh, ceratopsian. We got evidence of them potentially in thousands. Now, even if they're on a mass migration and they're mostly not eating very much, 
they're still going to just be, you know, almost like a cartoon. There'll be a row of them just yeah, moving yeah, yeah. and everything behind yeah, them will just be, be the, the equivalent of those those shots that you see of US wheat fields with an army with of, combine of, harvesters. of combine harvesters moving across them is what I imagine. That, that's what it will be. And they will eat everything because yeah. they weigh a ton. They can't afford to be choosy. Their digestion is good enough to hack just about anything that goes inside. Yeah. It'll all ferment. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> But imagine the compost they leave behind. Well, yeah. <laughs> well, it may may not be that good because if their digestive efficiency is super good, they're really breaking that stuff down. And so they're not passing out a lot, which has a lot of organic potential in a way that, you know, no, hor- hor- horses are really poor digesters, for example. And a hu- horses produce a lot of waste in part because they're not digesting very much. But if you're fermenting everything and then, yeah, they might not have, you know, you wouldn't have these huge piles of poo. You just have, you know, small and perfect. But it also wouldn't necessarily be that good what they're leaving. But, you know, if you if you had it, putting it on your roses wouldn't do very much. Uh, good thing they didn't have roses. Well, exactly. <laughs> Thank you for listening to the Terrible Lizards podcast. If you want Terrible Lizards to keep bringing you more information about the world of dinosaurs, then we need to hear from you. Send us your dinosaur drawings and ask us your questions via terriblelizards.co.uk. Email terriblelizardspod at gmail.com. Find us on Patreon, Facebook, and at Izzy underscore Lawrence and at Dave underscore Hone on Twitter. Include the hashtag Terrible Lizards. We're hoping to bring you more and more, but we can only do that if we get enough listeners. So please like, share, and subscribe. <laughs>